thank the Lord for the opportunity we have to gather together and study the word of God together. Amen. Um, I'm not the first one to disappoint you in life. There are other men who have disappointed you. It's a it's a very good mosquito net, you know. <laughs> and keeping away the unwanted, you know. I think when the when the, the right time comes, yeah. Why must you clean up someone's house? They must clean it up for themselves. <laughs> but uh I think it's a very it's a very good look come to talk about. It. I think I like it, you know. I like it. I started off it started off as a small little project when I was doing my Hebrew reading and I said you must not shave your beard on the side because that represents that in whatever you do remember the orphans, the widows. So every morning when I wake up I must remind myself that it's in the Bible that uh, there are also widows and orphans that are included as part of my estate. So it's a constant reminder on my face. But uh, when the lessons become spiritual, then we can always remove them. But get used to it. Get used to it. uh, Amen. Amen. Glory to God. And some people must not harass us because the soil is quite fertile. That's why the beard is also, you can see the quality women would kill to have this on their heads. Amen. Wonderful. Um, There's a little song I want to try and do. You might not know it, I don't know. But if you do, you know the song that says, Jesus cares. Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. You know the song? I'll play along. Just give me some nice strings in the background. If the spirit moves and... uh, tells you what to do, you know what to do.
I'll still challenge the band after all the nice songs. Just pick a few hymns and get, get familiar to some nice, solid stuff. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. I know it's nice to get in the groove, but uh, you need, once in a while you want to just, you know, place, place it there. I mean, the older ministers will know what I'm talking about. Uh, I brought my daughter with me today. Amen. Uh, that's somewhere there. Somewhere there. <laughs> Brothers-in-laws and everybody else and my brother. And God bless you all. Yeah. It's nice to be here in the house of the Lord. Someone say hallelujah out there. You can see some women are looking at me with great suspicion. You know, it's fine. By the end of this service, we're all going to be good friends. Amen. <laughs> nice to see you, comrade. And I want to pay my homage to the pastor of the house, the apostle of the house, Pastor Stolle, a brother, a father, an uncle, and everything else that my other pastoring friends are not. He has become that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, and... Uh, I feel funny every time I'm introduced in this pulpit. Uh, I think I'm, I declared my interest a long time ago. I'm not a visitor here. I am a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a member here. I'm a member here. So don't, 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 don't do that to me now. Today I want us to discuss a very important um, uh, subject. Lord help us all. Uh, from the book of Kings, Second Kings, Chapter 5, I read with you from verses 1 to the end of that chapter, which gives us roughly 27 verses. I will not promise that I will exhaustively look into the entire passage, but we will pick up some elements that the Lord will share with us tonight. Before we read the word of God, can we pray together? Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity we have to open your word. As we do so, open our minds. What am I but just some pebbles of dust in the fingers of grace? Let it be possible that as we continue with our discourse, you will have a conversation with all of us to the salvation of our own souls our humble prayer and petition that the Holy Ghost himself would fill us full with his goodness. We ask for these blessings to be given to us in the name above all other names, the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 The story I want us to look at tonight is a beautiful story which has very fundamental Lessons that I think all of us can take home with us. We are introduced to some military general, uh, a man of reputable accolades, professional man, a killing machine, if you please, a man whom God had used, please take note of that, though he is a Gentile. The Bible says through him God had won battles for the Syrians and the Lord had strengthened his hand. Therefore, I would want to submit to you that the fact that you're successful does not mean that, uh, that you're in the house of the Lord. Even Gentiles succeed. They succeed. It, it is the grace of God that also makes sinners succeed. In the hope that when he shows them goodness, they will also repent in the midst of it. Yes, so we can not only claim goodness and blessings as Christians, come on, come as if sinners don't have access to the grace of God. When a thief steals your wallet and they are praying while they are running and you are chasing behind them, let us see whose prayers will be answered. It's even worse as a Christian if you are not returning offerings and etc. Then why must God protect your money? It must go to other people also. So the Bible does not spare us these beautiful details. As some of us wish it could exclude the people who are outside. Because our thinking always has to do with us and them. Us and them. And we put ourselves on a pedestal of advantage. And we look at the outsiders as if they don't deserve God. They don't deserve mercy. 
that don't deserve any goodness. We miss God with a mile. God is not a Christian. He is a savior of the world. For God so loved the world. Not Christians. He can't be a Christian. Otherwise, it's idolatry. He worships himself. He can't. He's God of the Muslims. Come on. Hello, they are there. He's God of the Baha'u'llahs. He's God of the Hare Krishnas. He's God of everybody. Whosoever wills, whoever accepts the gospel, there is access into the house of grace. We don't have exclusive rights to the brand of Jesus. Least you get infatuated with self-importance that is corruptive to your own senses. You are not an exclusive holder of the brand called Jesus. At the mention of the name of Jesus, nations must fall and bow down and say, Jesus is Lord. The in the introduction, we hear that Naaman himself is not just a small boy. Please read carefully. The Bible then says, Naaman, commander. I take my brief very seriously. Yeah? You say, I said, let me go military also. You know what I'm saying? Let's go military. You wanted military style? Let's go for it. Naaman. Of the army of the king of Aram, a great man. Please take note of that. We're tired of talking to small boys who hardly have anything except a name. You know, what is it? Show us your value. It's just a name. You want to read about some great man? There is a good CV right there. Neymar. Commander. Neymar. Great man. Neymar. Master. Oh, come on. If you have a good translation like mine, you, you would wonder, you would wonder how much, how many more titles can you give to this guy? Highly regarded. Highly favored. The man whose shadow commanded respect. When he stood up, even those who had no agenda stood up with him. That's power. Power is not doing things. Power is causing things to happen. Let's redefine it. Some of you think you are powerful and you are working. You are poor. Those that are powerful cough and the whole world catches a cold. That's power. See, this is Zulubati, no menzi, no menzi, wa. Umenzi, wa, agana mind. Umenzi, nguyona mind. The one who causes it to happen is the powerful one. So we're dealing here not with a noun, we're dealing with a verb. The man who causes things. To happen. So when you hear about his accolades of commander, master, leader, great man, highly esteemed, it's not the titles that you must fear. It's what causes he effects when he appears. That's power. And women run away from power, by the way. Because there's a woman who shouts until she's blue on the face to get a bulb changed in the house. And there's one who says very little. She lifts a small finger and all the bulbs in the house are changed and the dogs are fed. I have a question for you. Who is more powerful? So women who talk too much are weak. The ones who are powerful don't use power at all. Power is ability to cause to happen using less energy but maximum output. That's power. 
The woman just goes, <clears throat> and the man already knows there's a problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Quickly, he revises what was supposed to be done, what has not been done, and what's my position on this whole thing. What does the future look like? What does the past look like? And he positions himself out. Sorry, Mama. Shame on you. Powerful people use less energy. Maximum output. Maybe it's a principle you need to start learning. Use less. Make more. When you see yourself sweating too much, your brains are not working. There is a problem somewhere in the upper hemisphere. Here. There's a problem. When you connect it correctly there, you use less down here. I think that's the principle of working smart. Naaman was a big man. Influential man. Powerful man. Highly esteemed man. Highly regarded man. Because through him, God had even worked through him. So take note, please, before you think Naaman is a pagan, please understand that in the midst of power, God was also part of the equation. Okay. Clarify with you, there are sinners out there who have God as part of their equation. Because sinful as they are, they're looking after people you can't look after in your Christianity. <laughs> Baonja imizi, ba kulisa izalugazi, na mantua ba zoba, kulisa umpaka atiba. They are sinners of high value, sinners of high caliber. But in the midst of their high sinfulness, they are conjures in the hands of God to perform in this earth what Christians are not willing to perform. So through him, God had done many things. I'm correcting something in your mind. Mm. Wherever you see goodness, God is there. Yes. Yes, sir. Come on. Wherever you see mm. goodness, God is there. The devil is not a maker of goodness. Let's claim all of it. It belongs to God. Even if it is 2%, that is God. Are you not with me, guys? That is God. Even if it is a little bit, that is God at work. For if God is given an opportunity to perform, oh, the little things can become much when they are placed in the master's hand. Right. Naaman, Lord had worked through him. Please, I like these prepositions of internalization. God had not worked at him. Uh-uh. It worked through him. To get some certain things done. He was a conduit. It flowed through him. And did not do anything to him. You missed it. The prophetic ministry is a true ministry. Not an ownership ministry. You can't own it. <laughs> what you, you can't own what you don't have. It was never yours in the first place. God just uses you as a channel through which he wants to get somewhere. And when that happens, step aside. You can't take credit for anything. It had nothing to do with you. It is not about you. In fact, you are not anything except the tool that he has in his hands. Hello, somebody out there. Amen. I know some tools want to feel like owners. Because after they have performed the duty, they increase their own value. My God. They want the titles that go with it. My Lord. But uh, the Bible tells us also that the way God uses pre people of God, he also uses sinners out there. Equally the same. Through him, God, you want to know what he had done? So through him, the Lord had given victory to the kings of Aram. That's power. 
So even when Naaman won the battles, he must be careful not to think that he won it by himself. God was setting him up. Some things are done without you praying for them. Oh, that's powerful. Least you think that every good thing comes because you've contributed. A little bit of prayer, a little bit of offering, a little bit of church going, a little bit of halom fundis, and a little bit of an SMS, and a little bit. And then when you look at all these things that you have done and put them together, you say, yeah, when the good thing happened, how a shame. I've been king, I had worked actually. That's why I ended up with this. Correct it from your mind. God does not need you to perform anything to do anything for you. In fact, let me say it in a more nicer way. Don't do good things because you want to be saved. Do good things because you are saved. One more time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Don't work because you want credit. Work because you are credited for righteousness. Hello, somebody out there? Therefore, when you do good things, oh, another one, you don't do them for God. Do them for yourself. God does not need to repent. You do. God has a correct understanding of value. You don't. You still think money is important. God does not. So when you give things away, you are not helping God. You're helping yourself. You're correcting yourself. Therefore, the works of grace on earth are not an accumulation into our entrance requirements of heaven, but an affirmation that the war of sin has been fought in the human flesh and has been overcome. These are the fruits of the people who are in transit to another country. Hello, somebody out there. If you not read the book of Hebrews, that says, and all these died in faith. They did not receive their rewards thereof. They saw them at a distance and they welcomed them. And whoever says such things truly admits that they are a stranger, an alien in search of a country of their own. Verse 16. And therefore God is not ashamed to be called their father. Verse 9. For he has built a city for them. The performance of grace therefore cannot be an accumulative we subtract because where we are going, we have more. Come on, guys. Come on. Are you, are you catching it? Are you catching it? In other words, not giving is being greedy. Because what are you going to do with it? Both here and there. Oh, come on. Come with me out there. You have more than you need. And you still hog and hold on to it. Then your understanding of your destination is messing up your present life. Let wealth flow through you. Oh, come on, someone out there. Let life flow through you. Let it go through. Don't block. The movement of the spirit in your life. Oh, someone say hallelujah out there. Hallelujah. Did, did you hear what I said? Yes, no, in case you don't hear me well, if water must run through your pipe, you can be sure you'll be wet all the time. It's not right. <laughs> this is the movement that is life itself. To occupy is to cause to rot. To let go is to maintain freshness. Therefore, water is as fresh as it is constantly poured from one pitcher to another pitcher. If you let it, let it sit in one pitcher in less than three, four hours, that water is now rotten water. Movement keeps freshness. Whatever it is God has given you, if it does not go through, it is getting rotten. And by the way, it corrupts you also. 
when what God has given you is not given where it must arrive. It corrupts the vessel where it is. That's why ministers are the worst sinners. Ask me why. They don't give away what God has given them. It pushes you to the other extreme end. Because if you don't let it go, it will mess up the very vessel in which it is. Hence, the Bible introduces this beautiful concept of God worked through him. Hello, some prophets in the house? Yes, sir. God works through him. And not with you. <laughs> yeah, you miss it. You miss it. Because but if it is with, it has to do with companionship. When I go left, I go right. So, I go left, I go right. So, I go left, I go right. I go left, I go left, I go right. I go left, I go right. I go left, I days. And on the fourth day, it's, uh-uh, it's not about you. If it is a through message, you are actually, you are present but absent. God performs as he desires to the destination of his own choice. Hello, somebody out there. Come on, tell neighbor through you. Come on, tell neighbor through you. Through you. The last part of verse 1 will mess you up for a very long time. After we have done such an illustrious introduction of power, influence, military pros, success, conquests and defeats, mastery, leadership, skills, all of that put together. Bible puts a part which you can use, number one, as a comparative statement. You compare everything we have said on top and the two words we are going to say at the bottom. You can be the judge. Two, you can use but as a transitional statement. We were talking about these things. Now we are talking about those things. Either way, Naaman is found in deficiency, in the midst of maximum capacity. He has it all, but he commands it all, but he leads it all, but he was a leper. Ah, I'm going to sit a little bit there. The fact that you got it all, you got a problem, girl. Got a problem. There is a common denominator. That eats from the palaces of Rome to the streets of Joburg downtown, Good Street. From the palaces of Windsor to the Mkukus in Deep Sleet. There is a problem that is on every wall that eats all of us and does not exclude anybody. Including those who look like they have it all together. They are suffering from the same problem. You didn't hear me. If our problem is the same, then our solution is also the same. But he was a leper. Oh, come on, come with me now. Therefore, your commanding office cannot camouflage the rot inside. Your authoritative voice does not rhyme with the relationship you have with your own flesh. You might look like you're powerful on the outside, but issues of faith are not external. Let us look on the inside. What is happening inside there? So don't tell me what you are doing on the outside. I want to know what you do in your privacy. Don't give me titles here. I'm pastor so-and-so, prophet so-and-so, bishop so-and-so, bishop my foot. What you do is what matters at the end of the day. What is it that you are covering up on the inside? For people are people not on the externals. People are people on the inside. We have created a ministry that adores external veneers. Long suits, big rings. Big happiness, 
big corsages and cuffs that are tying people's necks and heads that block other people from seeing the pastors in front. <laughs> and when people have these things around them, we look at them and say, his story is right. But when you get closer to that person, you discover you can put a pig in a Lamborghini. When it packs, it is still a pig. Therefore, a car does not change the status of a pig. The heart of man is corrupt, rotten. It is deceptive above all other things. Who knows it? It even lies to its own owner. Ah, Jesus. The issues we are discussing of ministry are not external issues. They are internal issues. There are some amongst us who must step down a little bit and just leave these things alone for some time and find out what is God saying? Before you put words in God's mouth and end up a liar yourself and desecrate yourself and cause curses upon your life and your family, shut up a little bit. Shut up a little bit. How can you say there's a word from the Lord you have not even prayed for the past two weeks? Which word? Which word? Which word? Is this Microsoft word? Which word? Where there is no connection, therefore, there cannot be communication. And the inside men of Naaman, who had it all on the outside. When you look on the inside of Naaman, he was a dying man, dying slowly. He had leprosy. Tell neighbor, I got a problem. Come on, tell him, tell him like you believe it. Say, I have a problem. Because the quicker you admit it, the better. Don't look like you're okay. You are, you, I also have a problem. I have a problem. If God is not gracious, I would not be here also. I, I, I got a problem. You better also agree you have a problem. Yes, sir. My God. Sure. Lord Jesus. Issues of faith, therefore, are only dealt with in transparency and in truthfulness. He dressed nicely outside. But ask him to take off his jacket. His gowns and his clothes. And you would find traces of reality that was camouflaged by a robust external big presence. Neyman, you got a problem. And big problems have small solutions. Let me do some philosophy with you a little bit. Big doors hang on small hinges. If you find a big door and you look behind the door, the hinges are not the size of the door. The hinges are small things like this, but they hold very big doors. Therefore, big things in life are suspended by small decisions in life. It is these little foxes that spoil the grapes. Put aside even the small things that so easily entice. Chapter 12 of Hebrews. And run the race of faith, looking up to Jesus, or then perfect of our faith. Let me turn the story a little bit and let us talk about a negligible girl, a slave girl, in the house of a king. Small little damsel. KJV would say, negligible, in the midst of his conquests. He conquered everything until he conquered. What can be conquered? He collected trophies and collected servants and ended up with this beautiful young girl. He said, this one is good for my house. He had a physical duty for her, not knowing that God had a spiritual setup for him. For a little while, let me just turn these tables around. Do you know where God has placed you? Sometimes the situations are to your disadvantage but to their advantage. Didn't hear me? 
We want comfortable lives, but life is not about being comfortable. Sometimes God would reduce your rights, reduce your privileges, and place you in compromising positions where your own personality and everything else feels desecrated. Not for your good, but for their good. This young girl, we don't hear about her anywhere else in the Bible except here. She appears but once and disappears from the pages of inspiration. But her story will be told as long as the black book is there. That there was a girl. Now, I want you to compare the two. The introduction of Naaman on verse 1 and verse 2. And the titles that are given to him. And the introduction of the solution. Even the name is missing. The title is missing. The function is missing. Everything that is said there is derogative and negative. She was a slave girl in the house. But she had some secrets that she knew. For every time she was washing Naaman's clothes, she saw some things. Stains. Pieces of flesh. Stuck up on the clothes. Pass this. And every day as she was doing the clothes, the condition was not getting better, but the condition was getting worse and worse. I want to believe that Naaman had enough perfume to fumigate everybody and make it feel like everything smells just fine. But there is someone in the house who knew the correct condition of the army general herself. This little negligible. Uh, let me say something to you. Do not underestimate small assignments. Come on, say hallelujah out there. Do not underestimate small assignments. She washed up my own mind. Cleaned up. Noticed. It was no longer in the underwear. It was now in the vest. It was now on the sheets. It was on the jackets. No, now it was on the bedding. Oh, what's the something wrong that's happening here? And her job was becoming more difficult. This is the story behind the story. Yes, sir. Until one day she gathers up momentum. Now here is the role of a prophet. Prophets must be knowledgeable. Oh, you didn't hear me. You didn't hear me. The Holy Spirit does not baptize ignorance. <laughs> Emptiness is not a virtue of the Spirit. Yes, sir. You better know something. So that when the Spirit comes, He will help you and remind you the things that He has taught you. Are you with me? There? Therefore, if you have a vacuum, what can you be reminded We can't have people who just blow wind. No. Literally blowing wind on the microphone. <laughs> wind. And we're supposed to receive something in that wind. The young girl was a prophet. Ask me why I say that. She walks up to the man. That's courage. When the man could not walk up to himself, she walks up to him. Oh, you're not with me, guys. She commands the man who usually commands other people. She masters the problem which had mastered Naaman. Hedgeman. Come on, somebody out there. She has a solution and a recommendation unsolicited. Power beyond power. Power that instructs an instructor to obey. Oh, king, live forever. You got a problem, chief. You got a problem. And where I come from, these things can be sorted out. Hello, somebody out there. Now, now to me, that's the word. Tell me, that, that, that's the word. You know, somebody, at the end of the day, at the midst of it, all of beautiful words you can speak. If you cannot introduce the man, you missed the plot. Listen, guys, you cannot be telling people is part of being prophets. Let's be open. You can't do that. You are in the prophetic ministry because you want to introduce us to the man. Come on, guys. 
What do you want to do? You want to tell the world that where you are coming from, uh, these things can be solved. Hello, somebody out there. Can, can I just take a minute there, right there? You know, when you get married, guys, you, you get married and you sign up a piece of paper, which they call a marriage certificate. What do you call it? One more time. What do you call it? Now, when you have a marriage certificate, welcome, Bishop. When you have a marriage certificate, you don't take a marriage certificate and sleep with it. Take that damn piece of paper, roll it up in a plastic bag somewhere, throw it on top of the wardrobe. Look for some two-legged sinner in that house who looks like a human being. That's what you married. Hello, somebody out there. That's what you married. Leave the paper out. You will need it some years. Maybe another 15 or 20 years if there's a problem. But if there's no problem, we don't need papers here. We need the human being. Oh, come on. Can I say something out there? Therefore, while we are in the churches, we are not looking for doctrines. We are not looking for papers. We are looking for the man. Next time, don't ask me, do you believe in that? Do you believe in that? I don't believe in that. Show me the who I believe, not the what I believe. Christianity wants to major on the what, which is facts, information, papers on papers, references on references. This is what we believe. I look aside and say, sure. A piece of paper called a marriage certificate won't get you pregnant, girl. It won't pay rent. Are you with me out there? It might give you entitlement to rent, but it will not pay rent. Many women have those papers and they are not having rent paid. So piece of paper is piece of paper. Oh, you're not hearing me, guys. Next time you're reading the Bible, don't look for the words. Look for the men. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Look for the... I have many things I can share with you, but in your prophetic voice, if the man is missing, you are a liar. Oh, I want to cut just across like that. Shoop, with a razor wire. Just shoop, once in a minute. You know that kind of cut, when it cuts you, you won't notice that you are cut until you see your limb falling on the ground. Then you know, ah, it was a sharp cut. If you are talking prophetic stuff and the man is missing in the story then you don't have a story for history it's his story she has a beautiful message simple and straightforward you got a problem I have a solution the solution is not here I come from. She knew her story. She knew her system, Lebanon, her environment, where she came from. She knew her prophets. She knew the power of God behind her. Even if she was in trouble, but there's something that she knew which Naaman did not know. Follow somebody out there. Therefore, correct methods of prophetic ministry is introducing people to Jesus. I know you want to tell them which house to buy, which car to buy, which husband to marry, and what and what. So what? They are still going to get these cars and have accidents in them. God help them if they don't die in their cars. So the issue of salvation is not about where are you going to buy your next house, which husband are you going to marry, which, which car are you going to want. No, no, come on, guys. These, are, these are, are not the gospel. Show me the man. And she says it in a beautiful way. There is a man where I come from. Hello, somebody out there. Can I say something right there? Where are you coming from? Before you can tell us the things that God has told you. Where are you coming from? Have you seen the man yourself? Hey, you guys are not here with me. I'm not here with me. Am I talking to somebody out there? How can you introduce us to a person you don't know? He, the word of the Lord says, do you know the Lord? This is what the Lord says. Are you sure? When did you last see him? 
it feels nice. Someone to just walk up to someone and says, hey, God is impressed on my heart. Yeah. And he is here is a message for you. He is a prophetic message for you. Wow. Yeah. I wish life was that easy. Isn't it? You just wake up in the morning with two cups of coffee and you're already in the Holy Spirit to tell people <laughs> what the Spirit says. The woman says, where I come from. Come on, underline that part there. Where I so I want to ask you, where do you come from? Tell us where you come from. And introduce us to solutions where you are coming from. And she was she beautiful. She had the name, the address. Hello, somebody? And the complete prescription of what will be done there. And she gives the man a full solution. See, correct prophecy does not create dependency. It creates independency and autonomy. Many prophets want us to be their followers. Because you and God discussed my life in my absence. All of a sudden, I am obliged to following behind you. Because we are not going to be Next time you see God, give him my address. <laughs> Tell him, number 12, Waltma, Qantas van der Waal, Nokem Park, 1618, Ekrulen. That's why I am at. <laughs> it makes it very suspicious that you and God have a conniving meeting that discusses my future. My life, my children, my what, my everything. So now, so you are going to go to the house. So, if you are going to go to the house, if the prophetic word is correct, it must send the servant to go and perform without your supervision. Follow the young girl. There is a man where I come from. Now, you want some help? You pack up your bags, make your way to that land. And what you're looking for, the solutions are waiting for you. Someone say hallelujah out there. Hallelujah. And the man begins to walk, packs up his bags. I like that part there. This man is a pagan. But you want to know that he was a good man? Do you want to know he was a good man? He does not just go to the men of the Lord empty-handed. But in verse 1, we thought he was a pagan. A non-believer. But listen to what he does. Pack some gold. Pack some silver. Pack some expensive ornaments. What? And packs. 600 of this, 300 of this, 100. Go and read for yourself at home. Enjoy the passage. And he packs a few donkeys as gifts. Oh, that's faith. That's faith. He had a celebration of what God would achieve for him before it was even achieved. Oh, let me introduce a new principle there, Pastor. If you want something, Offer in advance. Oh, you didn't hear me, guys. You didn't hear me. Let me say it with power. Let me say, some of you wait until it comes. You will never get it. Like Naaman, before he even received his healing, settled his donkeys and his horses and everything, packed his gifts. Gratitude in advance. He was withdrawing in advance. He did not know where he was going and what would happen there, but if what she is saying is true, when it happens, I must not be caught empty-handed. Anticipation. Don't come to the house of the Lord without expectation. One more time. Don't walk into the house of the Lord expecting nothing. You don't expect to hear a good song. You don't expect a good word. You don't expect anything. You are just a passenger in the house of the Lord. You are a liability in the house of the Lord. The people whom we know need stuff from the Lord, they begin to withdraw in advance and deposit in advance. Settle his horses and makes his way to the land where he is going to receive his help. Principle number three or four that I will share with you. He arrived. Hello? 
He, when you travel in life, arrive. Don't be permanent tourist. Arrive. We are tired of these members. Now just about no oasis. So just about no oasis. So just about no oasis. My tourists, they just everywhere. Arrive. Arrive. Fika, fika. I want to go nyonyo with my friend. Nyonyo, I just busy on check and just busy on check and just busy on check and just arrive. And when you arrive, principle number four: don't allow your titles to overshadow your blessing. One more time. Don't, don't, don't consider your self-importance as importance. You will forfeit a good thing. Having traveled all this way to come for solutions. Now the man of God, being the man of God, God had already visited in my head and said, Naaman on his way. Coming to your house. He got a problem. You got the solution. So before he even arrives at the house, Prophet Elisha dispatches a man to him ahead of schedule. This is how it sounded to Naaman. You are sick. You are dirty. I don't talk to lepers. You have victimized our Israeli girl for a long time, touching your clothes with blood for a long time. You're not going to walk into my house and contaminate our space. Before I can even talk to you, Naaman, go and wash. Now, to him, Naaman, the washing idea did not come as a solution. This is me thinking. It was like a requirement prior to, uh, to being attended to. He did not know that the solution was in the humiliation itself. So now he looks at himself. He looks at this man who has been given an instruction. And he says, man, what, who does he think he is? The least he could have done, at least, is to show his face and greet me at least. Does he not know that where I come from, people greet me? Does he not know where I come from, that I command? Now, how can he command a lesser vessel? I need to talk to Elisha one-on-one, -on -one, commander on commander. You can never equate yourself with God. So, Eli Elisha sends a word. Naaman looks at the word and underestimates the word because the word for him will mean he must bathe first and when he is clean, then he will come and be attended to on his leprosy. But God is not a fool. He is very conservative with energy. The small things he asks you to do, the solutions are in the problems. You didn't hear me? The solutions are in the problem. So Naaman is fed up. He says, bugger off. Let's go. Leave this fool alone. And the servants are the ones who look at him, including Elisha's servants, by the way. He said, my Lord, my Lord, if you were smart enough, messengers number two, prophets number two, those that encourage others on the path of righteousness. Are you with me? Don't only think about being prophetic and saying big words that are talking about the future. A good prophecy also says, don't worry, troubles will linger for a while, joy comes in the morning. Hang in there, God will come through for you. That's a word in season that can cause someone to hold on a little while longer. Someone say hallelujah out there. So they look at him and say, chief, chief, chief. Chief, chief. With all due respect. We have traveled far, say, say, and I'm fed with it, say, yes, say. Listen to us also, say. We are here. We are not there. We are here. What he's asking us to do is not impossible. Jordan is not far from here. It's just here. Let us bath. You lose nothing, my Lord. If it works, hallelujah. If it doesn't work, we lose nothing. Let's get down to the water and let's bath. A good, encouraging word will get more done. That's a good word of encouragement. It can achieve far much more than pearls and diamonds. They drag the general against his will. 
It was an issue of convenience now. Because I'm saying, I'm going to go to the house. 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 I'm going to Unfortunately, when God wants to put things straight, he does not give you a half-baked cake. He says, go and bath Naaman seven times. Not two. Because you can do one, a quick one. And run. He said, no, seven times. I think he started off as a joke, you know. Check himself. A little bit again. Just stay, sit there. Sit there until it is done. Now, those of you who have done a little bit of geography, you know Mount Hermon and where the River Jordan flows. It's right on the fatal crescent. It's muddy water. Lots of greens are there. Grass grows in the River Jordan. So you don't want to know what leprosy looks like. Are these big white things that are sores on your body? Now, you mix leprosy and mud and leaves, and grass, and dirty water. Now, you know, now I give you another solution. Before it gets better, it must get worse. Come on. Before it gets... See, there are people who want to be saved in a smart way. But clean. There are big full-time sinners who want to be spoken to nicely. But the message is very good, but they approach, man. They approach how? They approach you on foot. You are a sinner. You are dying in sin. What approach? How smart can we be to help you? Just get into the water. Fix up the problem. There's no protocol. But I mean, ukulume, akakulume ngaka asemen. Inya iso lento asbati inkel, inkel, inkel dayani, inkel okuyo na yokseni man. It will get worse. Before it gets better. Come on, tell neighbor, tell neighbor. It will get worse before it gets better. Right there you learn the principle of stay with it. Come on, tell neighbor, stay with it. Stay One more time, say stay with it. I know sometimes you feel like giving up and throwing in the towel. Come on, let me preach like a New Testament preacher. But hang in there. Hang in there a little while longer. He who is coming will come and not delay. Do not give away your confidence, for it shall richly be rewarded. After you have done the will of God, God will be pleased with you. We are not those who are easily discouraged and are turned away. God will not be pleased with us. We are those who hold on to the end, and the same shall be saved. For he who is coming will come and not delay, but the just shall live by faith. Hang in the muddy waters. Hang in the muddy waters. Hang in the mist of trash and damp. Come on a little bit a while longer. Hang in a little bit a while longer. Naaman wallowed in the mud like a pig. For a pig he was. What difference does it make? When you mix mud with sin, it makes bigger sinner. Bathed himself in mud and soaked himself. Four times later, soaked himself. Now he does not know whether to remove the leaves or the dust, the what. Then he says something that it torments me. He said, man, this is bad. Because where I come from. Now listen, listen to something that will blow off your head here. Where I come from, they are beautiful rivers. With sand. And stones and sparkling waters where I could have bathed myself than bathed in these muddy waters. I have a question for Naaman. If the rivers in your country are that clean, then how come you still have leprosy? Why are you here? If your rivers could make you clean, then why are you here? You are here because cleanliness in your clean rivers has no salvation inside it. That's why you've come to the river Jordan. In the midst of the muddy waters, God wants to make a recreation out of you. Six times down. Seven times down. Hello somebody out there. 
when he came out for the seventh time. Hallelujah. So when God is working, perfect obedience brings perfect miracles. One more time. Perfect obedience results in perfect miracles. Because miracles are not on number five or number six or number three or number two. When God expects the perfect number on you, hang on with it, fulfill it to the right end. For blessings are not in partial obedience, but complete obedience. Someone say hallelujah out there. Seventh time, Naaman comes out of the water. Leprosy had gone with the water. The sores had gone with the water. Broken flesh had been repaired. You didn't read your Bibles carefully. It says he came out of the water and his skin looked like that of a young baby. Oh. Now I know God can restore. God can start again. Lost things can be refurbished. Broken things can be restored. And God says to Naaman, you have been in the muddy waters so that you can go and bath in clean waters. Oh. Oh, let's run. Time is not with us. He jumps out of the water, excited, has the young baby. Now all foolishness has left his head. He feels right. He has a reason. Now he wants to go and see the prophet himself. He braces himself, runs ahead of everybody else. He's got good news. He's got good news. He's got good news. He is now clean and he wants to meet up with the prophet. Carries his bags of gifts and everything else. Gold and silver packs in front of the house. And says, Naaman, Naaman, Naaman. Elisha, come outside. Elisha comes out, an old man with a big bald head. And he says, well, I got some silver for you. I got some gold for you. I got some pearls for you. Some precious minerals are hanging on you. All these things are yours. Elisha working with God. Looking at a man and knowing the state of a man than the substance of a man. Because if you look at what the man has, you will miss it. Look at what the man is and you will know him. He looks at the man and discovers the man is still poor. Even in the midst of much. What he needed was some spiritual muscle on the inside. He must not think in his life that the things of God are for sale. They can be bought with two rand or five rand. Next time he goes back to his country, he would say, I went to that country. I left my gold. I left my silver. I left my pearls and everything. God healed me, but I left something for him also. And Elisha looks at him and says, Chief, with all due respect, go home, pack your gold. Pack your silver. Huck. Leave my premises. Thank you very much for coming. Something for you guys. You don't have to collect an offering for everything. You didn't hear me? You don't have to collect an offering for everything. One day you're going to collect an offering for leprosy. No, wait, I'm coming there. When the chariots disappear, Gehazi, the senior protocol director in the affairs of Elisha, he's watching all this stuff going. Going. Going once. Going twice? Going! Says, no. This can't be. I don't want everything. Just a little bit of what the guy has. So while they are leaving the house, Gehaz runs across the side of the hill and meets them halfway down the road. Says, oh, my chief made a mistake a little bit. Can you uh, just give us a little bit of some? He says we can have some. He was not alone, by the way. He had servants with him also. Be careful to be an accomplice of mischief. 
Be careful to be used by other people to achieve wicked ends. They collect the gold. They collect the stuff. He takes it to his own house. Hear the preacher. If God could see Naman, God can see Gehazi. The muddy waters of Naaman were inherited by a man called Gehazi. He took sin offering. He took leprosy offering. I want you to be careful when it comes to the issue of offering. All of us who are here, be very careful when someone puts their hand in their pocket and they give you something. You don't know what is it that they are giving you. Some of you are always having your hands out, waiting to collect handouts. That's group number one. Group number two are the ones then who say they work with the Lord. And because they work with the Lord, every bit of work that they do must be followed with an offering. With an offering for this, an offering for that. We want truthful men. When the spirit of the Lord works in you, you must be able to discern. And you see it coming. And you say to some of them, Limfet, take your money. Go. Take your offering and go with it. The rest of the story, Gehazi took the stuff. When he's arriving at Elisha's place, Elisha says, Ubuyapi. Ubuyapi. We had just gone around the block here. He said, uh uh, don't waste my time, Chief. Waste my time. You have worked with me for all these years, but you have not learned a basic principle basic principle. And I think that's where many of us miss it. We might know the trade, but we don't know how to handle the trade. And that's where the mistakes are. Here, at the bottom of the, of the food chain. Now, Gehazi, you, your wife, your children, your grandchildren, first generation, Second generation. Third generation. Fourth generation. They have an inheritance. The decisions you make as a man of God, as a woman of God, are not for you. They are for your children. One more time. They are for your children conclude the passage and Gehazi left the presence of Elisha as white as snow with leprosy that contaminated him, his family for four generations down the road. Why? He did not know when to let go. Greed. Appetite for materials. You can't use spiritual gifts for material gains. Come on, let me talk like a preacher. Let me talk like a pastor. You can't use it in the name of Jesus to benefit yourself. You can't. You can't. You cannot withdraw. You cannot withdraw substance from people by using the name of the Lord. You manipulate people with the name of the Lord because you want access to materials. That is categorically wrong. You can't do that. I say so with a heavy heart because someone here must hear this message. Let go. Let go. The sicknesses and diseases and demons that you are praying for and chasing away, you are going to inherit as a portion in your family and your children and your grandchildren because you did not know how to allow God to work through you. In closing, the young girl said the word. Passed through. The people encouraged the man. Qualities of a good prophet. Qualities. But one, 
introduce us to the man where you come from. Have a word of encouragement. It does not have to be prophetic all the time. Let it be an empowering word that encourages others to do what is right. There's benefit in that. And thirdly, don't always collect offerings for the works of grace that you perform. Freely you have been given. Freely let them receive also. And the last principle, if you do not learn the easy way, your children will curse you and your grandchildren. Every time they walk past your grave, they will spit on it. Because you'll have brought things into the family that God will not be happy with. Muddy waters are the waters of baptism. Waters of cleansing. Pride. Jealous. Envy. Attitude. Wash it away so that when you come out, you can be as white as snow. I feel like praying with someone tonight. Someone who's not yet baptized here. Someone who has not yet been to the water. And tonight you say, man, I feel, I know, I also need to be washed. Shall we gather in the river that flows by the throne of God? It is possible that your destiny can change in Jesus' name. Can I pray with someone out there? Just one person or two.